uh, this evening's virtual uh, webinar where we just want to open up a discussion with you all. As our attendee list populates and as everybody logs in, we'll just give everybody a minute. Uh, go ahead and get comfortable and get acclimated to who's on the screen. We'll go through some introductions in a minute. Uh, but again, I want to say thank you for spending your time with us. We're just going to give it a minute or two while the attendee list populates, and then we'll, we'll get started in a minute. Really quickly, while we're uh, while we're waiting for our attendees to populate tonight, uh, the goal of tonight is to is to just uh, communicate a little bit about what's going on recently with the COVID crisis, uh, answer any questions, give a quick external division update, um, and then of course answer any questions you may have, whether it's related to the COVID issue or whether you have anything in general. Uh, it really, in essence, this is just another way for us to try to get in touch with you and allow you to conversate with us as well. So we'll get started here in just a minute as the attendee count is still growing. As we, um, as we get started tonight, it's a couple minutes after six, so we'll, we'll just briefly get started. People can join us as it, as it moves on. Um, I just want to first introduce myself. My name is Dan Schmidt. Uh, I founded RMC Events about 21 years ago. It was April of 1999, and we started that day with, uh, with eight employees, eight staff members, and here we find ourselves sitting here tonight on this call, and there's over 2,100 family members in our organization right now. Organization on the event division side handles over 11,000 events a year. And here on the external division side, as you all well know, we've got two robust offices, one in the Charlottesville area, one here in Richmond, that handles not only accounts at UVA and VCU, but an ever-expanding client portfolio in the external security uh, in the external security world. So there's a couple key folks with us here tonight that are going to be able to answer your questions. And, and really, before we go any further tonight, I just want to allow them to introduce themselves and, um, and again, I'll just say thanks for joining us. This organization um, has, has grown and, and this family has grown over 20 plus years, but here we are today with our leadership um, sitting down and, and having a virtual conversation because that seems to be the way it has to be done nowadays, but having a virtual conversation with, our, with members of our family to answer questions that you may have uh, with regard to not only new policy, new protocol, but programs as a whole. So we're thrilled to do this. Um, I've said this before, we'll do this again as long as there's interest here. If you, if this works for you um, and you enjoyed tonight's conversation, please send Chris and Dave and Sean, send them an email and tell them this works and then spread the word and we'll do more of it. We will do this as many times and, and as often as you wish us to. So on that note, I'll turn it over to uh, Sean. Sean, just go ahead and we'll start some quick introductions. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Real quick before I get into that, if you guys look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. As we progress through tonight, if you have guys have any questions, just click on that and it will send us all the panelists the questions and we will answer them the best we can in real time during this. Uh, so for everybody, I'm Sean Jacobson. I am the Executive Director of External Programs for RMC. I've been with RMC for a little over 14 years now. Uh, the first 10 years of my career with RMC, I was the Director of our Western Event Operations. So all of our events in the Richmond area, Harrisonburg area, Newer Valley area, anything west of Richmond fell under my umbrella. Uh, four years, a little over four years ago, an opportunity presented itself with UVA to step outside the box of something that we normally did not do, uh, which led us into creating this external programs division of RMC. Uh, for the past four years, I've uh, led up that division, and I got a couple awesome managers and directors that are here in this call that will talk about their respective programs, but very happy to see you all tonight and look forward to the next hour. Thanks, Sean. Let's move on to the Western region. Dave Mickleberry is here with us tonight. Dave, do you want to say a few words? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Mickleberry. I'm the director of Western External Program. So uh, I pretty much take anything uh, west of Richmond for our external programs. Uh, currently, uh, we're managing the UVA program, uh, parking and transportation, and uh, any events coming via UVA on the security side. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Uh, from the Eastern side, uh, as our, our account manager here at the VCU program, Chris Garrett is on with us tonight. Chris, do you want to say a few words? 
Certainly, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, like Dan said, I am the account manager for VCU and recently have taken on as account manager for the collegiate school. Uh, I joined RMC 14 months ago after retiring from Henrico Police as a lieutenant after a 30-year career. So uh, thanks again for being here. And if there's any questions you have, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Chris. From a human resource perspective, we want to make sure if you guys had any questions uh, that related directly to human resources, we had a representative here for you. And Bob Palkovic is with us tonight. Bob, do you have any words you want to share? Sure, Dan. Thanks uh, to everybody for being here tonight. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, I've been with RMC about 16 years, and I also uh, retired from the Henrico County Police Department just under 26 years of service, and Chris Garrett and I were actually in the academy together, so we've known each other a long time. Uh, I'm the director for Human Resources, and we encompass personnel, uh, training, staff, performance, recruiting, any side of that. So hopefully I can be a resource uh, if you need something answered tonight and then going forward as well. Thanks, Bob. From our operations and logistics team, our director of ops and logistics, Sam Langley, is here with us tonight. We thought Sam, Sam's presence here tonight would be helpful if you had any questions with regard to ops, logistics, as we start talking about PPE and other type of equipment needs. Sam is the man behind the mask on all that. Uh, no pun intended, or every pun intended on that. So, Sam, do you have any comments? Uh, no, thank you, Dan. Uh, I've been with RMC. I'll start my 18th year in November. Uh, 18 fun years, I'll say. It's uh, been a pleasure. Uh, we have uh, hope everybody and their families are doing well and, and everybody's staying healthy. I miss seeing people. I went to a kickers event on Saturday and saw a few staff members. And it was very exciting for me. So if you have any questions or any needs from the ops department, uh, just please reach out to us. Thanks, Sam. And uh, to my right, uh, I don't know on your screen, to your right, it looks like uh, BG is here with us. Um, BG can be found everywhere. Um, he's been uh, pretty much in every market, every every event, every external uh, services program we have. So you've probably seen this man running around. You got anything to add to the conversation? Hey, guys, good to be here. appreciate all you guys being here. I know you're busy. But yeah, I've been with uh, the company about 13 years and uh, a little bit of the event side and a lot of the external side in the last couple of years. I basically help Sean with whatever he needs. And uh, I know there's some tough times over the last few months, but I promise we'll get through this. We'll be back high-fiving and shaking hands soon. And I can't wait. And uh, uh, it's going to get here. We just got to be patient. And in the meantime, just abide by all the rules and, and keep smiling and making eye contact. And uh, we'll all get through this together, brother. Thanks, BG. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. Our attendee list is still growing, so we're glad everyone's been able to, uh, to log in here tonight. Um, again, a quick reminder, as you have questions or if you think of questions, you can use that, like Sean said, use that Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We can monitor those questions as they come in. We'll get to as many as we can tonight. Uh, Dylan Gordon is here with us kind of behind the curtain, and he might be able to answer some quick questions. He'll shoot you a quick response. But if it's a question you have, we want to make sure we answer it tonight. So use the Q&A button and send questions to us. The, the purpose of tonight really is, is a couple things. One, we're seeking every way to communicate with you. And if this adds another way to do it, well, then fantastic. You might run into Chris downtown. You might run into Dave in the substation. You might see Sean or BG on site. Um, but if this is another avenue a way that we can funnel some questions and help you with, any, with anything you need, we want to do that. So that's the first purpose. The second one is we do have some updates to provide you this evening with regard to some recent COVID policies that the Commonwealth of Virginia has announced. You may have heard it. We'll go over it tonight. And then we want to give you a few external updates. Chris and Dave will have an opportunity to talk about their programs a little bit. Sean will kind of give you a general overview of where the external program is and some opportunities um, for growth. And then, of course, uh, we'll take questions and answers along the way. So. Use the Q&A button as you see fit, send questions if you need them, and we're glad to answer them. So Sean, before we move into the COVID document, is there anything else you have for us before we get into the agenda a little bit? No, I think let's just push forward. All right, excellent. Um, one of the things we wanted to share tonight, one of the, one of the agenda items, that we, one of the key purposes for tonight's call is to talk a little bit about what's going on with regard to COVID-19 and some of our company actions to, to help mitigate uh, the, the crisis for us and our, and our staff members as they're working. So 
a couple of things to be real clear about. This document that we that we talked about tonight will be embedded in our 2020 employee manual. You'll get an email on that here within the end, before the end of this month, and it'll have all these updates in it on paper for you, so you could see it. Of course, anytime you want this document directly, you can contact uh, one of our division directors, and we can get it to you. But moving back a few months ago, back on May 28th, our organization released a document uh, called Safe. It was a safe document. We have it loaded up. Uh, Dylan might be able to screen share it just so you can kind of get an idea of it. But what this document was on May 28th was it outlined our training protocol, our curriculum, and the steps that we were taking to try to keep our employees safe throughout the COVID crisis. So as you can see right there in front of you on, on the first page there, it's a quick summary about what we were trying to accomplish uh, with regard to this document. SAFE you know, stood for Staffing Assurances for Facilities and Events. Now in the external division, facilities could be the residence halls at VCU. It could be any of the positions that we man up in the Western region with regard to the ambassador program. But if you scroll through this document, you can see we laid out some curriculum and some training protocols. We laid out um, some, some employee and on-site health and wellness protocols with regard to PPE, temperature checking, and, a, and a really importantly, a work or no work and return to work protocol. One of the keys when we built this document was, how do we not only protect our staff members from the public when they're working in, in the external services division, but how do we protect our staff members from each other? And, and at times we, we had to ask ourselves a question about, we don't wanna remove an employee from working, yet at the same time, we have an obligation to you members of our family to keep your work environment as safe and as healthy as we can. So a lot of these protocols that you're taking a peek at, not only ensure that you're healthy when you come to work, but we're also trying to guard so that when you come to work, you know your coworkers are healthy as well. So a lot of the protocols in here deal with self-health checks before you come to work, temperature checks, and of course, as you're seeing now, face coverings being required um, across the board. So. Historically, that document that Dylan has up there, we created that on May 28th. We shared it with an industry task force with over 170 leaders across the Commonwealth, and we've got pretty widespread approval on what, we, what direction we were headed. Well, then the Commonwealth came in in late July, and on July 27th, the Commonwealth published what they've, what they've called uh, an emergency action to Virginia Code. It's a Virginia Code 16, BAC 25-220. And what it does is it places specifications, it places specifications on employers of what they must do in order to provide health and wellness for their employees. Well, when we read this document, it's, it's, it's 60 something pages of document, we were already meeting that. Our safe document was, um, was meeting 95% of that. We made the adjustments to the pieces that we still needed and then we rolled out a new document, and that's this document that we're gonna go over tonight. So the document that we're gonna to review tonight is basically a combination of what we rolled out in May, and then what we realized the state came out with on July 27th, and we've merged them together into one specific COVID safety guideline document of, for our staff's health and wellness. And what Dylan's putting up on the screen now is that document. So as you can see right there on page one, it gives a brief overview, and then it talks about training and curriculum. The 10 bullet points in training and curriculum on top right there, those were the first ones that we had already designated to include in our curriculum program to keep you safe and to make sure our, we're training our employees on health and wellness with regard to COVID. The bottom ones there are a little bit more specific, and those are the ones that were specifically called out in the emergency actions by the State Department of Labor and Industry in their emergency standards on July 27th. As you can see, they're very much in line with what we already had but we made sure we called them out on this document. If you flip to page two, you'll see that this document takes us into a little bit more detail. The first thing I wanna to mention today is the self-health check attestation and work, no work expectations. This is important. So when this is released in a few weeks, you're getting an advanced look at it. But when this is released in a few weeks, per Virginia guidelines, we have to have this released by the end of August. We'll beat that guideline as well as we're ahead of the prog we're ahead of the program already but a couple things you're going to be required and expected to test and monitor your health on an ongoing basis basically before you come to work just take a self-health check 
And if you have symptoms of COVID, which could be a cough, shortness of breath, a fever over 100.4 degrees, and other relatable symptoms to COVID, this document and Virginia code requires you to call in and not come to work for that. If you have been exposed to COVID, please note, if you have someone in your house or someone you might've been exposed to, Virginia code, this does permit you and, 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 and ask you to contact us as your employer and tell us, but if you're not experiencing symptoms, you are still entitled to come to work should you wish. You voluntarily could take yourself out of work and take voluntary leave, but you don't have to for this code. So the self-attestation ask is this, before you come to work, take a quick health check and ensure you're healthy enough to report to work. Staff members may be asked, you might be asked when you report to work to verify the results of your self-health check. Might ask you if your temperature was below, might ask you if you're experiencing symptoms. It's simply to verify of the self-attestation check. Work and no work decisions, this is important. It can be made by you or it can be made by us. If the organization thinks that you're showing symptoms and signs of COVID, the organization can ask you to leave work and you also may voluntarily put in the leave work for signs and symptoms that are COVID related. Any employee receiving a positive test result for COVID is required under this emergency code to notify us immediately of such a positive test. That will enter you into our COVID work protocol, which we'll go over in a second, and we'll go over how you return to work from that. But should you get a positive test, you're required to notify your employers, us or any other employees you have, uh, immediately, and you'll then enter your COVID protocol, which will keep you out of work for a designated period of time, and we'll go over it in a second. And lastly, per this emergency code, RMC Events does return the right does reserve the right within the same code to prohibit any staff member suspected to be infected with COVID from remaining on the job site. So remember, for us to keep you out of work for COVID related symptoms, not only are we trying to protect the guests that we serve, we're trying to protect your coworkers and the rest of our family from it as well. So that's what this code, emergency code put forth by the Department of Labor States, and that's how we're meeting with it on our, on our end. On arrival to work, you should expect a few things. One, you might see temperature checks beginning. You might have already seen it. Some of our staff this weekend went through a temperature check when they arrived for work, and you should expect that might be a, uh, a, 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 a common thing you might see at, at the workplace moving forward. In the Western region, for example, it might be a little easier, right? The substation, when everybody comes in, it might be a heck of a lot easier to perform that check. In their eastern region, you might be contacted by your command dispatch person via phone, via radio, or you might have a supervisor swing by and either conduct that test or ask you screening questions. But again, it's all in an interest to keep our staff uh, healthy uh, in and around each other. At any point in time, those tests and screening questions may be asked. And that new Virginia Emergency Regulation Code gives us the right to send an employee home if A, if they fail the test, or B, if they refuse to take the test. Moving on to page three, health and safety at work. I know that we have sanitizer available. You've seen it at the job site. You've seen wipes available. We've provided PPE face coverings. We've allowed you to bring your own face coverings. A couple things to note at work. Hygiene is important. And in this policy, we ask you to be vigilant about washing your hands and maintaining quality hygiene when you're off the job. But when you're on the job, we want you to take the opportunities that are present for you when, when practical to utilize restrooms and wash your hands on a regular basis and or use hand sanitizer when you can. Physical distancing and physical contact asks are also in this document. We ask that you remain physically distant when possible and we ask that you uh, refrain from physical contact when possible. It's hard for a guy like BG to not give out high fives uh, but for the time being, high fives and any kind of non-essential contact, uh, handshaking even, is asked to be refrained from during this time. Please note, in this emergency code, the Department of Labor specifically called us out and we'll sh our industry out, and we'll show you what they said when they listed us as a medium risk industry. They called out every single industry and they list us specifically with campus and school institutions um, and in the medium risk category, and they laid out exactly the distancing that they feel is necessary in and around our work site. We'll come back to that in a second. 
with regard to PPE under this policy, face coverings are gonna be required. You saw an email go out in the Western region just a few days ago. Um, face coverings should now be considered part of your uniform. You should carry it with you wherever you go, much like you do with your pen and your paper and your ID badge. I carry mine with me everywhere I go and it's with me all the time. Um, and it's just gonna become part of our uniform. So it is a requirement of the position. Keep in mind, we wanna be flexible for you to wear a face covering that is both comfortable and feasible for you. So you are permitted to provide your own face covering if you'd like under certain regulations, or you can talk to our division directors and we'll provide face coverings for you. However, please note, if you provide your own one, it either has to be mask style with loops going around your ears and fully cover your nose and your mouth, or it has to be a gator style neck guard that you can pull up and put in front of your nose and your mouth. No bandanas are currently permitted. It may only be neutral color and style. Notice my gator is jet black. No logo, no verbiage, no wording on it whatsoever. It has to be neutral in color, no logo, no wording, no advertisements on it at, at all. The one exception to that rule is this. If you're working on the VCU campus and your mask or face covering says VCU on it, has a VCU logo, that's fine. And if you're working on the UVA campus, our client up there has also approved, you can wear a Virginia or a Cavalier or a UVA mask as well. They've approved that in addition to a neutral or plain. If you have any questions about this, please ask in advance so we can be real clear about what's permitted and what's not. And then finally, it needs to be worn properly. This is important. Should an employee of ours, should a family member have a medical reason for not wearing a face covering, you can submit that notification and I would do so very, very soon to hr at rmcevents.com. Please include supporting medical documentation. This new Virginia code allows us to grant you such medical exemption if you write to us in writing with medical documentation providing why it's a hazard for you to wear a face covering. Our HR department will acknowledge the receipt of your request and they will send you a letter of written approval that you must keep on your person while you work. You can either keep the document in paper on you and carry it in your ID badge holder, or you can take a picture of the approval documentation and carry it on your phone as long as you can produce it to your supervisor or account manager when asked so that they know that you have medical exemption. Because remember, your conversations with the HR department and your exemptions are private. That is not shared with anyone outside of the HR department, your personnel and the division leadership. So for you to show that letter as proof, that'll be, that'll be all you need. If you are asked, and my guess is you will be asked by a member of the public, a client, somebody walking down the street, why are you not wearing a face covering when everybody else has to? Here's your, here's your, uh, here's your response. You are only asked to simply and politely state that you have received a medical exemption from RMC events and then direct any other questions to your supervisor. At no time are you required nor should you disclose any personal medical information or any further information that I just stated above. Just that you've received a medical exemption and that if they have any other questions, they can speak with your supervisor. That keeps you in the best possible position that we can think of with regard to answering those questions. Following up on PPE with regard to gloves. If gloves are required on your post, we will provide them. Sam has tens of thousands of gloves in stock and we'll make gloves available should they be required. If you wish to wear gloves as your option, that is okay as well. The same rules apply as face coverings. Neutral and please stay away from latex as there's a, 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 a concerns about allergies with regard to latex gloves. So please stick to the nitrile style gloves. Moving on to the bottom of page four, this is your return to work protocol. There are two separate cases of return to work. The first is if you have a positive test and or display symptoms. In other words, if you are symptomatic of COVID-19, you have to meet three qualifications per this new Virginia code to return to work. One, you need to be symptom free for three days, 72 hours. And they define symptom free as 
symptom-free without the use of fever-reducing medications and an improvement in respiratory symptoms, cough, shortness of breath, et cetera. That's the first one you need to meet. The second one, you need to be at least 10 days since symptoms have first appeared. So when your symptoms first appear, you can't return to work until 10 days from that point in time and three days since your symptoms have been, have been no longer present. The third thing you need is you need to notify our HR department at HR at RMC events that you are three days symptom free and 10 days past your onset of symptoms. Once you do that, our HR department will email you back with acknowledgement and receipt of that, and they will give you work authorization. They will copy your division director so they know you can be scheduled again. But those are the three things. If you have a positive test or you display symptoms, you must go three days symptom free, 10 days from beginning of symptoms, and then notify HR and receive work authorization back. That's what the state of Virginia has laid out as of July 27th as a return to work protocol that is mandated by employers and employees for symptom related return to work. The second return to work is if you are asymptomatic. Suppose you take a COVID test because you had exposure and you test positive for, the, for COVID, but you are asymptomatic. Because of your positive test, you enter COVID protocol, but you're asymptomatic. So you only have to meet two requirements to return to work. The first requirement is that you have not displayed COVID related symptoms for 10 days from your test result. So if you are exposed to COVID and you take a test and you're positive, you go 10 days without symptoms, you may return to work. Your second responsibility and qualification is the same as the one before. Notify HR at rmcevents.com. They'll acknowledge receipt and they'll issue you work authorization and your division director will be notified. So if you're symptomatic, there's three qualifications, three days from no symptoms, 10 days from first symptoms and HR authorization. If you're asymptomatic, it is simply 10 days from your COVID tests until you can return to work with HR authorization. Again, note, just because you might have think or thought you were exposed to someone who has COVID, the Commonwealth of Virginia does not require you to leave work. We require you to notify us so we, can, so we know. You can still work should you wish. If you wish to go get a test, you can. That is your choice. If you test positive, you'll enter our asymptomatic protocol. If you then develop symptoms, you'll enter our symptomatic protocol. If you never develop symptoms and you never test, the state of Virginia does not prohibit you from work until you exhibit symptoms. And then you'll enter the protocol. So I know if you have any questions on that, it'll be in this document and we can answer questions tonight, but that's your return to work protocol. Many of you tonight might be full-time employees with us, and some of you might be part-time. If you are a full-time employee with us, this law, this Virginia Act, allows us to allow you to both utilize your time off as voluntary time off, or you know you can use your PTO, your paid time off with us. Part-time staff members take time off simply as voluntary time off from being scheduled. And finally, this document lays out our responsibilities for notification and contact tracing. Here are commitments to you per this protocol and also per our document. Upon any positive COVID-19 test within our organization, meaning as soon as we are notified, RMC events will perform the following actions. One, we will notify any and all other employees who may have been exposed within the previous 14 days from the date of that employee's test. So if we are notified by an employee that they tested positive, we will go back 14 days from that test date and we will notify every employee who may have come in contact with that person in those 14 days. Note, we won't release any private information. We won't release an employee's name. We won't release any details, but we will contact all employees as notification that an employee has tested positive and that you may have been in the vicinity of that person. Number two, we will notify other employers whose employees were present. Therefore, we must notify VCU, UVA, and any other entities who are on site. Number three, we must notify the building and or facility owner. Number four, we will notify the Virginia Department of Health. And number five, we will notify the Virginia Department of Labor if there are three or more positive tests within 14 days. 
And finally, we will maintain the confidential nature of employees' identities. So that are the steps that we will take when we get a positive test back in addition to the protocol that you will enter and we will work with you on. So again, as we close, this document did call out our industry specifically and listed us as a medium risk. There's very high, there's high, there's medium, and there's low. The following two industries were named as medium. On-campus educational settings in schools, colleges, and universities, and venues for sports, entertainment, movies, theaters, and other forms of mass gatherings. Our industries were deemed medium because they, quote, require more than minimal occupational contact inside of six feet with other employees, other persons, and the general public. For example, the Department of Labor is clearly stating that in order to operate on our campuses within our operational format, there is contact inside of six feet that is more than minimal. So therefore, they've listed us as medium, therefore they've required face coverings, therefore these protocols are in place for us as it applies to a medium risk industry. Again, in closing, this is only part of the equation. What we do and what we can do is only a piece of the full package. We need all of you to be successful and to be participative in this. So that means if you have questions, you should ask them. If you are sick, please don't come to work. If you think you have symptoms, Symptoms of COVID, please let us know. If you're tested positive, please let us know. Please wear your face coverings. Please practice good hygiene. Please self-test your temperature before you come to work because we're going to ask you when you get to work. And if we do this together, not only will we beat this virus in a short period of time, hopefully, but we will maintain safety for each other. Finally, we understand and appreciate that some of these things may be temporary while others may be more permanent in nature. We commit to you that we will monitor this daily, every single day, and we will evaluate, review, and make adjustments as we deem necessary in order to keep all of you and our coworkers and our guests safe. So I know that's a lot, and I know we just took some time to go through this document, but it's really important you understand that we had a protocol in place we were comfortable with, the Commonwealth came out and emergency stated their own. We were in compliance with them to begin with, and we got even more in compliance with them this week, and you'll be receiving this via uh, email communication within the next few weeks. So again, on that note, if you have questions about COVID-related policies, please type it into the Q&A, and we'll take them as we go. Our next step on tonight's agenda is just to give our external folks some time to discuss the program a little bit, and then of course, we'll answer any questions you may have. Again, you can type them in the Q&A box, and we'll see them as they pop up. So on that note, we'll pause questions for a second, keep sending them in, it'll allow me time to collect them. And Sean, I'll turn it over to you and your team. Thanks, Dan. So while we have everybody together, and the good news is everybody that started this uh, webinar is still on this webinar. So hopefully you're finding this material useful and helpful for you. Uh, I just wanted to give everybody kind of an update on where we're at with external programs as a company as a whole. Uh, RMC Events, as you know from your initial training, we were founded in 1999 primarily as an event staffing company. Um, about four years ago was the first time we segued into the more traditional uniform security services. With COVID, unfortunately, the event industry came to a screeching halt. Uh, live events, whether it was entertainment, sporting events, stopped. Uh, that had a big impact on our company. With half of our uh, company based around events, whether it's collegiate events, entertainment events, professional sports events, came to a screeching halt. The good news is our event division, or our external division, kept going strong. And we actually gained some additional clients and added staff at our existing locations during this crisis. Uh, one of the big things I want to address, I know there's been some concern with folks on why are there so many event, uh, RMC event family members working within external programs right now. And the simple answer there is we did not want to hire any people and bring them into our organization right now while we still had folks that wanted to work from our event side. We have 2,000 other RMC family members that work for us in a part-time capacity on the event side of our company. We made a decision that we wanted to offer up hours to them. It makes sense for us. It didn't make sense to bring more people in and dilute the hours even more. So in Eastern, I know you've seen our folks working at VCU. Uh, Western, I know you've seen them working with the Ambassador Program and over at the garages. They've been a huge help. 
uh, as you know, at VCU, we were going to have a class of 22 folks that were scheduled to go through training during the week COVID really hit, and we were forced to kind of cancel everything. As a result of not having those 22 people coming on board, we were immediately faced with a shortage of staff. That's when we started opening things up to our event division. Uh, all of our folks on the event side have had the same exact training as everybody on the external side, with the exception of CSO training or any really specific training for an individual program. Um, so they received the same training, same messaging. They, they um, talk the same language as everyone in our external program. So it makes sense for us. Uh, in the first couple of months of doing this, we were able to put about $170,000 back into the pockets of our event staff division family members working external programs. Right now at VCU, uh, our event family is helping us out with about 40% of our staffing needs. I do want to be clear. If anybody has ever wanted more hours in our external programs, if you're a full-time staff member or a full-time staff member working under 40 hours or a part-time staff member, we have those hours. Granted, they might not be during the same exact days and shifts you want, but the hours exist. All you have to do is ask. Uh, that is still goes true now in all of our divisions. So if you're looking for more hours, please let us know. Once we can't fill all those hours, those are the shifts we are opening up to our um, event side family. So you'll continue to see them. Please make sure you welcome them when you see them, help, ask, help answer their questions they're gonna have, but they'll be an integral part of our operations moving forward uh, for the realistic future. Uh, with the unknown of football in the fall and going into basketball season, this just makes sense for us to get these hours into the hands of all of our family members. Um, so it's a good model for us. A couple just quick questions that came in as we were talking a few minutes ago. Um, one question was about what are students being told about wearing masks? I'll let Dave and Chris answer that question specific for their programs. But overall, in any of our settings, guests are required to wear facial coverings. There are some exceptions to that. Um, but overall, if they're in a public setting, they can't respect six feet of social distancing. They're going to be required to wear a facial covering. Uh, the other question that somebody asked, are we still enforcing the attendance point policy? Yes, we have to. We have to have an attendance policy in place and make it equitable for everyone. If you are sick and need the call out, we can excuse that if you provide documentation. However, program management also has uh, the ability to uh, grant exceptions to that as well. If you cannot make it to a doctor, they get a doctor's note for whatever reason, they'll work with you the best they can. What we look for with attendance violations is patterns. If you can't make it to work five times a month, um, you're always running late, or you're calling off every other Friday, we look for patterns. Um, so folks getting sick, that's not a problem. That's life, you're gonna get sick. Uh, especially nowadays, we want you to be careful when you're getting sick. So we will work with you the best we can, but you gotta be open and transparent with us as well. Uh, but yes, the attendance policy will stay in place. Another question also was regarding posts coming back online, uh, specifically at VCU where some of our posts went away and now they're coming back online. What we did when we did the scheduling for August and what we'll be doing for September, we're trying to put the same folks back in the positions they worked prior to COVID uh, starting. Uh, that is working right now. However, there will be some additional positions coming online that we'll offer up. We sent out an email about a week ago that had all of our current open positions right now um, for that program. And we sent it out to all of our staff. We got a lot of responses back. Keep in mind, we'll do everything possible to work with you to the best of our ability, but you got to self-identify and let us know. Uh, we're not mind readers. We wish we were, uh, but we definitely want to make sure that you're excited to come to work every day. So we'll do what we can to get you in the spot that you're going to be most successful. Uh, I want to turn it over to Dave right now, just kind of give some updates for our Western operations. Because uh, there's been some changes there, and there's going to be a few programs coming back online here shortly. Dave? Hi, thanks, John. Yeah, so far, uh, we're running pretty good. Pretty good. We're fully staffed. As you see, you see a lot of uh, events folks coming in. They've been a big help, specifically uh, Shift 3 uh, and the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for us. Uh, our, our Saturdays uh, are a little low overnight, but they've been a big help where we're back up into the normal staffing range. Um, in, in terms of the face coverings, I, I did put out the memo last Thursday, and that's a combination. The reason I had to do that is it's a combination of the city of Charlottesville, which we're in, Albemarle County have put in face covering ordinances. 
the UVA has a section about face covering ordinances. So it was just a smart thing to do because um, the students have been writing and are calling out folks who have not had face coverings. So just a smart thing to do. Uh, we are so associated with, with UPD that it just made sense. Our clients are all wearing masks or face coverings when they're dealing in the public. Um, so it just makes a lot of sense for us to do the same thing, to be uh, leaders and, and just do the right thing. What I didn't want to do is, uh, well, we just go, you know, we wanted to, to, to wear those face coverings and they're a requirement now, but once you come into the building, uh, you're, you're fine. Uh, just always remember those three W's, you know, wear your face covering when you go out, especially when you're dealing with the public. Uh, you want to wash your hands and just watch our distance, our social distance. Uh, for those who've been around this store corner, you probably know signs have gone up. Big, huge signs of the Bank of America. There's another one down toward uh, West Main that says uh, uh, West Main and all the businesses are open for business. And uh, a lot of that, again, says face coverings and stuff. Um, in terms of our parking and transportation, uh, we are coming back up online. As you know, we thought we'd be up August 17th, but they delayed uh, in-person classes for two weeks. So that's pushed us back two weeks. We just got word where uh, Safe Ride is coming back August 31st. You'll be on, uh, Scott and I are going to be working 10 hour shifts for everybody. So you only have to work four days a week. Uh, currently we're working uh, for those drivers who do Safe Ride, uh, uh, the big boy vans, those 15 passenger vans, you'll have a total of only three people on them now. The, the smaller vehicles we have, caravans and the transporter, they'll just be one person. So they're looking at having all vans out all the time because now the rides will be a little bit slower. They're looking at uh, deleting at least one um, stop here on the corner, probably up at Bank of America, and only make the only stop on there historic corner right across the street from the substation at the bus stop. So that's kind of a good thing. Uh, they are working. Um, uh, you will not, everybody knows EIG for safe ride. The vans will be moved from EIG. They'll now probably pick them up from uh, PNT at Millmont. Uh, be able to park on the street, no issues. Uh, pick up your vans there. They're going to put hand sanitizer, all the PPE in there that you need including a barrier. I don't know what type of barrier yet. They are working on it. You will not be required to clean the vans. Uh, PNT has created a whole um, uh, contamination crew, if you want. Uh, they're going to clean those vans with foggers every, every morning when you return those in. You're not required at all. They're going to mount some uh, hand sanitizer in there. And before the, the kids or the uh, the riders get in, they have to have a mask on. The driver will have to have a mask on. Um, and it's your choice whether you want to keep the window down and not run the air conditioner. Just depends on how many. Uh, as you know, the big vans are talking about removing one seat directly behind the driver so that there'll be only three seats in there and we'll stagger how they're sitting. One on one side, one on the window side, one on the far side to keep that social distancing within um, that van itself. Uh, there will be notes that are going out from PNT to say because of COVID, uh, your ride will not be instantaneous. That to be prepared to wait. They're actually going to be start pushing uh, for uh, for the students to walk if they're close by, and not have to use the not have to use the van as much. Um, so they're doing everything they can to really get more back to a safe ride and not uh, kind of the taxi driver. Um, in terms of uh, our garage staff, we got some new numbers about uh, five o'clock today. So Scott and I are going to start going over the, um, the numbers uh, to, to boost up that. Both Safe Ride, once Safe Ride starts, we will need a lot of help from our event folks to fill some of those gaps, yeah, especially in the garage. And we always knew we had at least two Safe Ride drivers that we want full time. Uh, or even part-time uh, to start filling some of those slots from last year. Uh, now, more important than ever, um, since we're going to have most vans out most days, 
Uh, it'll be just kind of a wait and see what the numbers look like. Um, unfortunately, our, our traffic and, and pedestrian control group uh, was canceled in March with the students gone. And I just got word today they're gonna cancel it for the rest of the year. So we're not gonna bring back our, our TPC uh, possibly in, in 2021. Uh, that was just the four people Monday through Friday led by um, Doug Lehman. Um, that came from UPD today. Uh, and I think it's just with the lack of students around, but hopefully that'll come back to us. Uh, we are seeing a lot, uh, obviously a little bit more activity, but what I want to do is make sure that the unofficial um, block parties coming up, uh, make sure you have your mask. We're not going to really get into it at all. Um, some of the stuff that um, I want to make sure we do is we want to stay on point, especially on our customer service. Those, those guys have cameras, students have cameras, and they're just waiting to call people out. Um, uh, so just make sure we're doing everything we can uh, to the best we can, uh, doing that real good customer service that we always do. Okay, thanks. I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Dave. Um, like Sean said, things on the event side have obviously slowed down. However, the Eastern external programs are still thriving. Uh, we opened up sheltering arms a few months ago and they're up and running with two staff 24 hours a day. Um, the new VCU's New Kent facility, they started about the same time, initially started with one staff per shift, but they have recently changed to two, chef, two staff per shift 24 hours a day. Uh, U of R will be coming online soon in anticipation of the fall semester. At the Collegiate School, we're still there 24 hours a day and they are stat, uh, preparing for school to reopen as of September 1st. VCU students are returning and staff have been back and things are ramping up for the fall semester to start on August the 17th. With regard to VCU, obviously, um, as you all know, it's been a very unique few months between the pandemic and the protests. Um, the dedication of our staff has been nothing short of tremendous. Y'all have come to work. We've made arrangements to get you to work if you had issues with public transportation or something during this time. And uh, I truly appreciate it. Your safety during both the pandemic and the protests has been paramount for us. And I told you that in an email um, two days after the riots started. We've got a great relationship with VCUPD. Um, we have been in constant communication with them through the protests, through the pandemic, um, to ensure your safety and that we get timely information for that. As you know, we've been at VCU the entire time that this pandemic has been going on from its inception. You're well aware of what needs to happen, what we need to do, but with students and staff returning, they're not so comfortable. I don't want to say we're comfortable, but we know the expectations. What we need to remember, as I've indicated in recent correspondence with staff, is that they may not be comfortable. We need to ensure that they're comfortable. We need to lead by example. There have been a number of changes in the past few months with regards to PPE requirements and protocol changes and procedure changes, new posts coming online temporarily related to VCU health. Um, with regards to post opening up that they needed and then they've since dissipated. However, we've been through with them throughout from the beginning. So the big thing for you to understand is we need to lead by example. And the biggest thing for that is like you've already heard from Sean and from Dan and from Dave, our face coverings. Um, the biggest complaint that I've gotten since staff had returned um, in July is complaints about staff not wearing it or not wearing it appropriately. I anticipate that continuing when the students return because they will, staff will expect us to be the ones to remind students that aren't wearing it either A, appropriately or B, um, at all. So continue to lead by example with the face coverings, remind the staff, remind the students, educate them. The university's policy is that when you're inside a building at VCU and it's a common area, you're required to wear the mask or face covering. So please ensure that 
um, you're doing that and reminding those that are not. Uh, as you well know, things are ramping up again. Classes start on the 17th. Um, most all of our posts that have not come back online will come back on the 17th, with the exception of the VMI building, the Health Hub, and CPSD. Um, they're postponing that until they start to have in-person meetings. Hopefully, once that happens, then we will be back in those posts as well. Um, your, our success in the external security services is solely based on your efforts. And for that, I say thank you from all the Eastern external management staff. And I appreciate the opportunity to work with you all and look forward to continuing that success on a daily basis. So with that, I will turn it back over to Sean or Dan. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I just wanted to close with one thing before I turn it over to Dan. Um, many of you in all of our programs in either division our roles and responsibilities have changed and evolved over the past several months. They will continue to change and evolve over the next several months. We need to embrace those changes. Uh, we have a big collective effort here in slowing the spread of this virus. People look to us because we're in authoritative positions for guidance. So simple things like Chris was saying, making sure we're staying in compliance with colleges and universities policies regarding facial coverings, social distancing, that's paramount. We need to lead by example. You all are in the positions you're in now because we trust you to do a good job with this. Uh, we have an, a tremendous responsibility moving forward into the fall with students returning to our different programs uh, to help carry the torch that the universities are asking us to carry. So please do the best you can, ask questions when you have them, and just remember that our responsibilities right now are great and they're only gonna get greater as we progress through the next several months. Dan? Hey, thanks everybody. Good, good intel there. And at this time, I'd like to get into a few questions and allow some of the panelists to answer some questions. So again, as a final reminder here, as we, as we get close to the end of our, of our webinar, we are shooting for, for an hour tonight. Uh, we'll stay as long as we can to answer questions for you. But as we get near the end uh, of this and we start getting to questions, go ahead and submit them on the Q&A if you've got anything to make sure that we can answer your questions. Um, one of the, a good question that was just submitted, and, and I don't know if, if maybe if, if Chris or Sean or Dave, if you guys could take this one, but uh, the question is, what are students being told about having guests from other buildings? So visitation rights, have we heard anything about that? Uh, I, I'm assuming this might be a really good question for people who work in our residential halls at VCU, but uh, have we heard anything on that? Yeah, I could take that one. So VCU has taken the stance that you cannot have guests, period. Um, our jobs have actually gotten exponentially easier in our residential positions at VCU. If you scan in and you're a student, the only way you can access uh, past the foyer is if you live in that building. So if your card uh, shows up green on the screen, you can come in. If it doesn't, you can't come in. There is zero guests allowed in any VCU residential building um, this fall. UVA is a little bit different. UVA does not have a centralized check-in desk at every residential building. Um, they don't actually have it at any building. So students are gonna be on their own to police each other on that. They are asking students not to have guests outside of their suite makes in their suites at any time. Uh, they've limited social gatherings across campus uh, and off campus to 15 people. So fraternities and sororities that have off-campus housing, they're limited to 15 people for social gatherings. Um, so the colleges and universities are doing their best to lay the expectations out, and they're really counting on the students to heed those expectations. I know UVA is tying in those expectations to the honor code. Uh, they're having UVA students sign something before they return about these new uh, regulations, and I know they're gonna be pretty strict on enforcing them when they do find people that are breaking the rules. Thanks, Sean. Um, Chris, did that answer it? Anything else you heard? Are we, are we good on that topic? No, Sean covered it. I mean, it, it can't get any easier for our staff, honestly. They don't have to worry about if this person's on a list, if this not. I mean, it's it's either green is good, uh, yellow is no, and no card is phone a friend. Um, you check with the RA or the HD, but it's, it's very simple for our staff and we just need to make sure that we're on point with this. If, they're, if, they've, if they've got access, they can come through. And if they don't, for whatever reason, then they don't until um, somebody from ResLife allows it to happen. 
All right, awesome. The next question I want to touch on is a two-part question. One, it deals with regard to working throughout the changes, throughout the, the, this COVID protocol, and it has a question with regard to hazard pay. I want to make sure I answered that. And then it also has a question about medium risk and how that's determined and, and, and where it kind of falls in. So uh, two things. One, I want to talk about hazard pay for a second because it's been brought up a few times. We've answered, look, if you've emailed us, we've answered your question. So uh, I know in the couple last couple of weeks, I've, I've answered one or two emails with regard to this. And I want to make sure it's really clear. We operate under a contractor vendor protocol. So when you talk about hazard pay, you've got to have the contractor and the vendor on the same page. So for example, uh, if UVA and VCU were to institute some type of hazardous pay for what they would deem essential workers, they would have to then determine that their contractors would be a part of that. For example, for us to issue any type of time and a half pay, we have to be permitted to do it on holidays by our, by our client, which VCU and UVA do allow us on holiday pay into the contract. So if they were to institute any type of essential worker hazard pay at UVA or VCU or really anywhere in between, they would then decide whether we come along with them as a contractor and vendor relationship. So please understand that some of those hazard pay decisions because of our contractor nature are left to our clients more so than they are to us. We, we can't just go bill and pay more outside of a contractual agreement. And then the question was really tied to the medium exposure. And I'll tell you what, I was actually pleased to see us be deemed by the state as medium risk. Keep in, keep in mind, very high risk was associated with cough and induction, intubation and, and handling of specimens and autopsies and things like that. High risk was even deemed around the healthcare and first responders, firefighters, police officers, uh, mortuary services type stuff. Medium risk, just to put it in perspective for you all, not only is it on campus educational settings, schools, colleges, universities, but, but it's daycares, restaurants, grocery stores, convenience stores, drug stores, pharmacies, construction settings, detention centers, um, retail stores, call centers, package processing, and veterinary and personal care facilities. So keep in mind that in a medium setting, they're understanding that again, we have minimal risk, minimal occupational contact inside six feet. The only, um, the only scenario lower than what we're at is considered low risk. And that is installation, telecommuting, basically if you're not in touch with the public. So I am, I'm comfortable with our ranking. I'm actually kind of happy to see it. They did understand that on sometimes we do need to get within six feet on some occasions, we are able to do our job outside of six feet, but the medium ranking explanation is that. Um, the next question is a three-part question, so I'll try to go through them really quickly. Great question, Anita. It's a fantastic couple questions, so let me let me bring them up one by one. So, if someone has tested positive, you don't we notify the people that that person has been around in the past 14 days, and you are not required to be tested. That is accurate. So we notify you as a, as a courtesy, as an information purpose only. It's deemed resp uh, responsible and required by the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we, we will do it. Um, we will go into a little bit further depth than the state even mandates by notifying everybody on the roster that day that may have come into contact. If you were an individual post, for example, at VCU and someone else from across campus, you wouldn't have had contact. But if you were in the substation in the Western region and you might have had interacting contact, we would contact you. But no, a test is not required. On that note, if we ever call you and do require you to go get tested for whatever reason, whether it's return to work or you're exhibiting symptoms and we request you to go get a test, you will not bear the burden of that cost for that test. If we ask you to be tested, we will make sure that we cover that cost for you. And the second part of that question was, what determines when our workplace would question whether or not you checked your temperature? Is it random? So you're talking about the temperature check on arrival. I would go say this. I would anticipate being checked or asked every day in order to validate your self-check. Now, by the state of Virginia law now, we're only required to require you to do the self-test. And our secondary check is just that. It is secondary. However, we want to ensure your safety while you work. So 
we did it on Saturday to all 41 of our staff on a, a one job site. And I would say to expect it. If it's not done, it would probably be more random than if it is. And please note, that could happen anytime, anywhere. You could be posted in a residence hall, a supervisor can walk by and buy Virginia code right now. That supervisor can ask you screening questions and take your temperature at any point in time in order to keep the workplace safe. So great question again, and I would anticipate it um, in, the, in, the, in the work site. And then finally, can we expect that our particular workplace would be that cautious for us all? Yes. So we want, if your temperature gets checked five times in a shift and you email me or Sean or Dick and complain, I'm gonna call and say, I'm sorry, but we're doing everything we can to keep you safe. I apologize for the inconvenience of the three second forehead test, but at the same time, we owe it to you to make sure that we're ensuring the safe and work environment that you're there for. So um, we will try not to ask you five, six times at work. Uh, we only are required to ask that you check yourself and perform a self-help check. But I will dare say that if we are testing you at work, please understand the reason why we're doing it and we want to keep you safe on the job site. So we owe it to you. We owe it to the people that you interact with. And quite frankly, the state of Virginia is requiring that we do as much as we possibly can to help curb this virus. So we will do just that. Dan has checked my temperature in this room twice. Sean, do you have anything you want to add? There's a couple questions rolling in. I'll close with them, but is there anything else I missed? No, I think you nailed it. So, yeah, this ahead. last question that came in, Dan, I'll take this one. Uh, Greg, thanks for the question. Great question. We've answered this several times in the past week since uh, Chief Longo sent out that email to folks and sent us the information as well. So the question is, um, are we expected to offer facial coverings to folks we interact with out in the streets uh, on, with the ambassador program? The answer is yes. However, it is not our job to go run across the street because we see somebody without a facial covering. The only time they want us to have this interaction and offer a facial covering to someone without one is if we're having an interaction with them. If we stop the help because they had a flat tire or they stop us because they need directions somewhere, those are the interactions they're talking about. They certainly don't want us to become the facial covering police on the corner. Uh, they just want us, when we're having engagement with folks, if they're not wearing a facial covering, to offer one of the ones that the university is supplying. Um, that, that's what they want us to do there. And just so we do have those, those have been delivered by UPD. I'm sorry, Dave, was there something else? Yeah. Uh, to follow up with what Sean says, we now have those in house. They were delivered by UPD. Gotcha. All right. So we've come up on our hour. It's it's been exactly an hour. Our attendee count not only continued to climb a little bit, but it held in there. As Sean mentioned earlier, that tells us that some of this information uh, you've either enjoyed it or you found it valuable. I would also encourage you again, if you found tonight's session valuable, please let Chris and Dave and Sean know. Um, and then also tell them what else we can talk about that might help us communicate with you better. And then finally, tell your coworkers, because if they weren't able to join us tonight, we are videotaping it, we will post it, and they'll have the ability to watch it later, but they weren't able to interact in the same way that you were. So I would just say, please spread the word if you found this valuable. I would dare say that our leadership group would come out here whenever necessary to answer your questions. And this is a comfortable and convenient way to do it. You can do it from your car, or your home, you can do it from wherever you are with internet access. So if this was helpful for you and you want more of these, send more ideas to us and we'll come back and we'll do this for you on multiple occasions. Um, as we close, I wanna say thank you to Dave and Chris for taking the time out of your schedules being here. Bob from HR and Sam from Ops, thank you all very much. BG, thanks for taking your time. Sean, thanks for putting this together for everybody. Uh, really briefly around the table, Dave, do you have anything else for the group? Or are you good? No, sir, I'm good. Thank you, everybody. Falco, you good? He's good. Thumbs up. Sam, are you all right? I'm awesome. Everybody stay healthy. Thank you. Chris Garrett? I'm good. Everybody knows how to reach me if they have any questions. Please do.
BG, you know I like to run my mouth. So while we're wearing these masks, you still got to be engaging and eye contact. And like Chris said, make those students feel welcome back and see that you're properly wearing your mask and look them in the eye and say, hey, guys, you need anything, let us know. We're here for you. It's for everybody's safety. I can't wait to see everybody again. When you see me visiting, I'll have my mask on. We'll do an elbow or something. We won't high five. <laughs> but uh, keep up all the great work, guys. We love you all. Sean, anything for the group? Yeah, I just want to close with thanking everyone. These are certainly challenging times for us, not only professionally, but personally. I know everyone has a lot on their plate. Um, so when you come to work every day, you guys have been remarkable. And, you know, I, I'm not, not going to say hiding the things going on at home that are causing you stress, but being able to work through them and still continue to smile and do a great job. So I just want to commend you all for that. It's, it's not easy right now for anyone. Uh, so thank you for your efforts you put in day in and day out. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Our clients appreciate it. So keep up the good work, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you to Dylan Gordon and Lynn Tinerello who are in the background answering those questions and making sure this runs uh, runs well. The smart people are not on the camera right here. They're back behind that room handling it for us. So thank you all very much. It was great virtually seeing you all tonight. Stay safe, be well, and reach out with any questions. Thank you all. Have a great night. Bye, guys.